thank you all for coming here today. This is an incredible milestone for the Murder Drones community. Uh, if you don't know, this video is, in, is five months in the making. It's been five months ever since I uploaded that faithful video announcing that I was going to be working on the best Murder Drones video known to man humanly possible, period. And probably always will be the best Murder Drones video in existence. I've always wanted to make something like this. And it's been an honour working with the people who inspired me to make Murder Drones videos in the first place. So I asked them all to create clips so that they would all form together to create a perfect Murder Drones video. And we've got a lot in store for you today. Some clips are short, some clips are, clips are very long. And we've even got some, a special announcement at the end of this video. So stay very tuned. Anyways, I sound very cringe doing this kind of shit. So without further ado, let's rerun time. 今天看起江长起中 may be the golden goose of murder drones, but if we are all being honest with ourselves, he is one of the most underdeveloped characters in the show. Ever since episode 2, he has been nothing but Uzi's lapdog. Like seriously, take a moment to consider what he has actively done in the show. In episode 1, he was a genocidal murder robot with a crush on V and learning how to be rebellious from Uzi. In episode 2, he's Uzi's protector. In episode 3, he's Uzi's protector. In episode 4, he's Uzi's advocate and therapist. And episode 5 actually slightly developed him and he acted for himself until Crozy invades and bosses him around for the rest of the episode. And in episode 6, he's just Uzi's love interest. The arc of him learning to be rebellious and his romance with V was essentially retconned out of the show for him to become an accessory to Uzi. He does show some promise of getting a little more depth after Tessa gives him a choice between doing the objectively right thing or being selfish and continuing to protect Uzi but I'm pretty confident I already know what his choice is going to be, especially if you've seen the teasers for episodes 7 and 8. Hello, hi, it is I, Ranks, and for a couple months I've been obsessed with a silly little web show named Murder Drones. And I think it's a great little show, but that's not the reason I'm here. Another obsession I've had is with power scaling, seeing how powerful a fictional character is. So I decided to combine these two ideas and truly see how powerful these fictional robots really are. I'm Ranks. And I'm Power Warrior, the murderest of the drones. And it's our job to analyze these little robot men, women, people, weapons, armors, and skills to find out who would win this death battle! Let's start off with the lowest of the murder drone's power hierarchy, with the worker drones. A worker drone is an autonomous humanoid drone, and an entire colony of them were created by their very own parent company, JC Jensen in space. Ooh. To mine exoplanets. They were used as slaves for a while, until the planet blew up! Kaboom! After years, they were finally free to make their own lives and choices. That was until J.C. Jensen dispatched the disassembly drones. This line of drones were specifically made to kill the workers. So in fear, they ran into hiding, remaining in there for millions of years. Not, not, oh, never, not millions of years. God damn it, I did that! Now, with their origin out of the way, how exactly powerful are they? Worker drones are designed to have more stamina and have larger quantities of strength than the average human. So, they can punch, punch, kick, kick, and break bones. Now, normally I discuss their abilities, but we don't have much to work with. So, let's get straight into the major feats. Now, these AI were mainly treated as gags. Ha ha ha. 
for the writers and slaves for humans, but with their advanced AI, they could do so much more than the average human. They've kept up with hypersonic missiles and dodged entire lasers. They dodged Tessa's ship, which was going at the speed of light. They've survived missile explosions to the face and explosions capable of putting the entirety of Copper 9 in a nuclear fallout. They've held their own against disassembly drones which can forcefully open steel doors and catch bullets. From these feats alone, we can already put any Murder Drones character's durability at large country slash planet level and their speed at hypersonic speed of light level. <laughs> I am out, boy. Now that we've talked about worker drones, what about the other version of worker drones? The disassembly drones. A disassembly drone is sort of a, a mutated, quotation marks, version of a worker drone. They have enhancements that are meant to be more powerful than the average worker drone. Their abilities range from durability negation with their nanite acid flight weapon creation, which can physically be anything they need in a fight and regeneration oh like God. Deadpool which can only be trumped by Potonic Blasts at specifically their torso. There are three disassembly drones we've seen on the show so far. Lil Nas N, J, and V. Lil Nas N being the fan favorite and V being dinosaur food. They're trying to be violent in combat and know how to disarm a person in many ways. We can scale every disassembly drone to N, which threw Uzi into the clouds with relative ease. We can scale N to V, which has catched bullets. Disassembly drones are second in the murder drone's power hierarchy, and are worker drone killing machines. Just know that if you hurt their friends, or even just slightly anger J or V, you'll be in for hell. Effective drones were cloned more. <laughs> Now let's talk about the climax of Murder Drone's power hierarchy, the absolute solver use. This is the peak of the drone power hierarchy. The solver users are the most powerful characters in Murder Drones. With the solver, they can regenerate, alter matter to whatever they want, alter gravity, and most importantly, create black holes. We can scale people like Lil Uzi and Lil Doll to Sin, who has destroyed the planet with her black holes. The same cosmic entity that can destroy solar systems. The only catch being that they must be corrupted by the solver in order to create them. Uzi has trumped the feet easily and could have killed her if he had the chance. And Tessa has classified Uzi as a universal level threat. So far we've seen four solver users and each one is destroying the world of murder drones more and more. The Absolute Solver is known as the antagonist of the Murder Drone show, but in my opinion, it has way more depth than just a threat. The Solver was humanity's mistake. The humans of the universe are slowly watching as their universe crumbles at their errors. Just this thought alone makes me think, how much depth does this funny little show about robots really have? I mean, people classify animation as a medium just made for children, but it can be used for so much more. To be completely honest, I'm proud of how far this community has come. We survived months without content, we deserve at least some recognition. This show has impacted my channel in various ways, and I thank everyone that helped me join this analysis, even local. I'm really sorry about doing the chaotic shit. Please, please don't ban me. I'm sorry, I'm just really autistic. To end off this analysis, thank you everyone, and good night. Whoever started this wants us to fight. I'm not dealing with anything well, but I'm done dealing with everything alone. All right, this is the outro. Thank you for everyone that helped actually like I don't know, I'm, I'm terrible at making outros. Thank you, Local, for inviting me onto this project. Thank you, Cosmo, for recording lines, because I couldn't. Thank you for Warrior just existing. Thank you, Derek, for being a bitch. Thank you, Chevez, for nothing. Thank you, Vanity, for being such a horny simp. Thank you, Drone Boy, for criticizing me. And thank you for Uncom giving me tea. Thank you, um, Jim. Jim was the greatest help. Jim was so good. And a Merry Christmas, everyone. But hey, that's just a theory. 
a murder drones theory, and thank you for watching. Wait, what? Where am I? Last thing I remember was somebody talking about my business email and... Oh, hey, didn't see you there. I'm Taromaniac, and I hope you like listening to me talking about murder drones, because boy do I have something to talk about. You see, for as much as I love this series, and for as much as I want it to be perfect, you have to admit that it does have one major flaw. It's all over the place. I don't even mean that in terms of the story like I've heard other people talk about. I'm talking about the series at its core. To kind of explain what I'm talking about, think about it this way. Both Liam Vickers and Glitch Productions officially describe Murder Drones as a horror comedy, which isn't wrong. It's definitely got enough blood, question mark, and gore to piss off a few uptight parents, and they definitely dedicate a lot of time and effort to giving us those funnies. The problem here is that there's like half a dozen other categories that Murder Drones could also fall under. You could call it an action series because each episode has a big fight scene or some other major conflict. You could call it a mystery series because one of the most interesting parts about it is uncovering this hidden lore about the Absolute Solver and what's going on between the drones and the humans. Hell, you could even call it a romance series at this point because holy f N has the riz of a literal Greek god. V, Uzi, that one girl, Sin, Tessa, bro gets more bitches than an NBA player. Insert reference to unhelpful commentary. Sorry, got a little sidetracked. The point is, Murder Drones is a show that's trying to do a lot of things, to the point where it might be spreading itself a bit too thin. It's not even that I think Murder Drones is failing at anything it's trying to do, because I don't think it is. It's just that by trying to do so many things at once, they're basically guaranteeing that they won't be able to reach their full potential in any one particular area. It's hard to give it your all on something if you're trying to do a hundred other things at the same time, you know? Anyways, yeah, that's about all I had to say. Hope you enjoy the section after mine. Unless they put mine last. Man, that'd be awkward. Either way, see ya. My fellow Americans, it seems that I've been kidnapped by a local British kid and brought on here to rant about a silly little show that more popular people here have talked about. If you don't know who I am, hi, I'm Slayer or Stinky. Why am I Stinky? Legally, I can't answer that. I'm a sentient PNG that likes to talk about a bunch of silly little things on the internet, mainly this show. Now, like every good thing in life, there can be some slight problems, some goofs, some minor inconveniences, if you will. And my main problem with this little show is that some characters just don't get enough screen time, mainly these two. So now I think it's time to get the pitchforks and pipe bombs and ask why these two just don't get enough screen time. That is the jock character in Murder Drones and isn't like the stereotypical jock who is usually just an asshole or a massive pussy when actually confronted. That is what we call around here a certified G. That actually cares and isn't an asshole and is also not a pussy. Bro actually tried to fight V and J in the first episode. He even called it the WDF, the Worker Defense Force, on their huge huffing of bullshit for not doing anything. And after the first episode, they just got a whole new meaning of what the f***. Then in the next episode, he goes back to help Uzi and N find out why people are going missing and was actually helpful in investigating. He was the one that brought the solver symbol on the wall to Uzi and N's attention. Hey, Z, what's this thing? Hey, isn't that your special eye? Don't call it that! So you're probably wondering, what happens to him after the first two episodes? Well, uh, he kind of gets downgraded from side character status to background character status to just not even showing up anymore. In episode 3, you see him once, just dancing for a couple seconds, and in episode 4, you see him get like two lines. The first one has nothing to do with the plot of the episode at all, and the second is just him replying to N, and then he just disappears, never to be seen again. He wasn't even on the bus to come home, did they just leave his ass there? It makes sense why he doesn't appear in episode 5 and 6, since they kind of shift away from the school and worker colony setting, but they still could have done something to lessen the blow of him getting phased out eventually. In episode 3, I, I really don't know what they could have done. They He didn't really have any involvement with the episode overall, so I'll just let it slide. But in episode 4, Thad did have some involvement with the few lines he had. Thad was talking to Lizzie, who is also a character that got phased out for the same reason as him, and for the first three minutes before Thad would disappear forever, you can see him talking with Lizzie, who is one of the people that got hunted by Uzi. And I don't know if I'm making some bullshit head canon here, but Thad and Lizzie do have some form of connection, and it's probably because they're the popular kids in the class. One being tolerable, and the other being a white girl with their Stanley Cup. Drink on that lead bitch and see how you like it later. Anyways, my point is, if these two have connection, and he has a connection with the murder drones themselves, and he has a connection with Uzi, why wasn't that in the rest of the episode during the activities or the campfire blunt rotation? I would have been fine if he just appeared during the activities with no lines, and then once it comes to the campfire part, he just says something and then walks off to do whatever. And if he did stay for the climax of the episode, it probably would have played out a little differently from what we actually got. Uzi went into a blind rage and started going after her classmates. And Thad and Uzi were on good terms, since before she met N, Thad was the only guy to show her any decency. So if Thad was being chased by Uzi, I feel like he would have at least tried to talk her out of it or calm her down and then Lizzie starts antagonizing Uzi again and she gets pissed. The episode continues as it would have with V coming in to fight and stops them and this version of Thad gets to come home.
SpongeBob didn't pay his rent. Jay's a third disassembly drum and Liam's way to show how much he liked. I mean, mommies. Jay is a dick to everyone and unlike Thad, she does get some more screen time, which is surprising considering she's mostly missing for the main plot. I think she has more lines in the flashback episode than the present time the show actually takes place in. And besides for a specific person that has a slight obsession over her. Did anyone actually miss her besides for the fact she's bad as hell? Now the main reason why she's been missing is because if we go back to, holy shit, two years now, she gets fucking disintegrated. And in episode two, you see her lower half crawl away and she turns into a worm. But I'm not counting the worm as screen time since technically it's not her and it even says it isn't. Oh, Jay's not here. We are trying to repair that host as per our directive. In episode three, you can see her make a full comeback in one piece. In episode five, you see her in the main outfit in the flashback and then we see her on the ice lake. And then in episode six, we see her chasing doll and then she gets sidelined again. Now, the way the story was written, there really wasn't any way to integrate Jay into it. She really was just written to be a background character. Now obviously in episode 6 everyone was hoping she would get more screen time and I feel like a way they could have done it is I don't know she starts antagonizing Uzi and N uh, like teasing them or something which would have been nice to see since it shows N's small character development by him not taking her shit anymore and standing up for himself and Uzi. To an extent I really just feel like Jay is just the biggest wasted character in the entirety of Murder Jones. Some honorable mentions that baby bow Bo, however the f you say it. Sad he was a one-off character. He turned out to be a G at the end. Alice, I think most of us forgot about her. I feel like Khan could have had some more screen time, but only just for the sake of existing. I feel like the way they explained what he's been through and his side of the story was fairly quickly, so just so he doesn't have to overshadow Uzi's story. I think we should just have a podcast on the radio of Khan talking about doors while I'm going seven in this cool zone. I feel like out of everyone on this list, one character in particular got done the most dirty, and that's my boy Frank. For the two minutes of screen time he gets, he gets disrespected for all of it. He gets left in the dark, with no tools to fix the roof, and he dies on a, just a terrible Sunday afternoon. Anyways, that's my little rant for this more popular Birch Kids YouTube video. Huge thanks to your no-brained ice cream for telling me about this collab. Huge thanks to Yagster for getting in contact with me on Discord and inviting me to the server. And obviously, huge thanks to your local YouTuber for setting this collab up in the first place, so that way all of us can be here. It's been kind of a surreal experience being able to talk with people that I've watched for about a year, and that these were the people who gave me the push to make the content I make. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with everyone here. Anyways, see you when this video gets released. Many Murder Drones fans will argue who the best character is, though the answer is quite obvious. It's Brayden. Now, a lot of you are gonna say, really? That guy? The guy with his head on fire? The guy who died in episode 4? Let me explain to you why Brayden is objectively the best character. Now, answer this question for me. How many characters in this show have kills? Well, let's see here. We have Uzi, the Disassembly Drones, Alice, Bo, the Sentinels, Khan, Doll, James. Tessa and, well, Sin, but we don't really talk about her. And then there's Brayden. You know, the best archer ever since Robin Hood. Seriously, this guy shot an arrow and then everything in episode 4 just escalated. Let's be real, episode 4 was pretty boring up until that point. Brayden single-handedly saved the episode, and in turn, the rest of the show. Brayden was a catalyst. He was the puppet master, the drone pulling all the strings. You can thank Brayden for everything that happened. You like Sauver Uzi? Well, Brayden was behind it. You like the OST? Well, technically, Brayden was behind it. And AJ Despirito. But the point is, Brayden still did it. He really started out the drama once you think about it, which is pretty funny. Not only that, he's also one of the only characters in the show to be voiced by more than one voice actor. He's been voiced by Michael Kovach and Elsie Lovelock. And last time I checked, a lot of other characters can't say the same. You still don't believe me? Well, here's the biggest reason as to why he's the best character. He without doubt had the saddest death in the entire show. It completely overshadows V's death, and honestly, I can see why. He may not have had much screen time or said much, but his impact on the show as a whole will not be forgotten. After Brayden died, a part of the show died with him, and it's not been the same ever since. May he rest in flames. Oh, many people to this day wonder why Khan likes Thor so much. So today I will read why. <clears throat> a door is an hinged, otherwise movable barrier that allows ingress entry into an egress exit from enclosure. 
The created opening in the wall is a doorway or portal. A door's essential and primary purpose is to provide security by controlling access to the doorway, the portal. Conveniently, it's a panel that fits into a doorway of a building, room or vehicle. Doors are generally made out of materials such suited to the door's task. They are commonly attached by hinges, but they can move by other means, such as slides or counterbalancing. The door may be able to move in various ways at angles away from the doorway slash portal by sliding on a plane parallel to the frame, by folding in angles or a parallel plane, by spinning along an axis at the center of the frame. I'm doing a wrap or something, I don't know. To allow prevent ingress or egress, in most cases, the door's interior matches the outside exterior side. But in other cases, for example a vehicle door, the two sides are radically different. Many doors incorporate locking mechanisms to ensure that only some people can open them, such as with a key. Doors have devices as knockers or doorbells which people announcing their presence. In some areas such as Brazil, it's customary to clap from the sidewalk to announce one's presence. Apart from providing access into and out of space, doors may have secondary functions ensuring the privacy of preventing unwanted attention from outsiders, of separating areas with different functions, by allowing lights to pass into and out of a space of controlling ventilation or air drafts so that interiors may be effectively heated or cooled but of damping noise and of the blocking the spread of fire. Doors can have Aesthetic, symbolic or ritualistic purposes, receiving the key to a door can chase the status from outsider to insider. Doors and doorways have frequently appeared in literature and the arts of metaphorical and allegorical import of a portrait of change. <sighs> I'm not done yet by the way. All types of doors. A half door or Dutch door. A salon door, a blind door, skip door or jib door, a French door, a louvre door, a composite door, a steel security door, a door 1, 2 and 3 on copper 9 made by Khan Doorman, flush door, a molded door, a wicked door, or a sliding glass door, an Australian door, a false door or a doormat. Yeah, that's why Khan likes doors, guys. Yes, I read the entire Wikipedia, well not the entirety, but mainly the main area of the Wikipedia arc article of a door. Hope you enjoyed that on whatever day you're watching this. And yeah, see you guys on my main channel, that's right here. I'm gonna do some self-promotion shit here because I can. And yeah, see you guys later. Goodbye. Right, so my name is Uncom, and in keeping with tradition, I'm going to be pointing out some stupid and ultimately meaningless moments in the Murder Drone series to try and get some sharp exhales out of you. So here's every time one of the cast members should have died. The explosion of this railgun is enough to kill Solver J, so it should definitely kill everyone in the classroom. The murder drones that have been attempting to get into this bunker for months are not stationed anywhere near it waiting for the door to open. N waits for Uzi to do this backflip and make a sarcastic comment instead of immediately cutting her head off. This is the first of several times the murder drones are shown to be completely useless with the laser cannons. V doesn't chase after the worker she just spotted. 
and lands to hit this sick pose instead of catching up to Uzi and killing her. All of these rockets miss Uzi. Khan does not get shot by either of these two. It took N all of half a second to kill the other guy he pinned to the wall, but he waits for a solid minute before going to kill Uzi. Then he doesn't. The massive hole in Uzi's shoulder that was leaking oil suddenly disappears and leaves her perfectly fine and capable of hucking this pen later. How exactly do you plan on removing viruses with a wrench? N should definitely be dead. None of these guys get shot instantly, and Thad somehow isn't killed by V here. Hey! Huh? Put that conventionally attractive male down! Uzi doesn't die of embarrassment after saying this. We now have a large amount of missed shots and whatever this is from all three murder drones. There is no way this distracts you enough not to kill N. Jay decides to monologue instead of doing her job, which seems slightly out of character. V doesn't attempt to break free from these very loose bindings and kill N. I'd join you if the sun didn't kill me. Hope you're having important character growth or something though. But you are still very clearly in the lights because we can see you. I don't know how exactly you want me to end this, so like... Hello everyone, as most of you guys know, I'm your no-brained ice cream, but you can call me Noor instead. I post all types of murder drone content, like theories, character analysis, and all these kind of things. And for the topic I chose to discuss about today is Khan, and I'm going to do a character analysis of him. I will be breaking down and analyzing the life he had with Nori, how the relationship fell apart, and what I really want to happen with Khan, especially in episode 7 of Murder Drones. Even if it means he won't be as much as a big character as I am portraying him right now. Now, I know that most people throughout the Murder Drones fandom don't really enjoy Khan's presence, but I do. I like how he's changing not only as a character, but a father. Gee. What are you doing, huh? Be safe, okay? Now, after episode 1, I think we all viewed Khan as a coward. And well, he is. He left his daughter to die and could have saved his wife. And in fact, admitted that he's not either of what Uzi or Nori needed. As both a parental figure and a husband to be depended on. Turns out... I'm not who either of you needed. Khan and Nori's relationship was pretty strong, especially at the end being near the Copper Nine Core Collapse, and when Nori gave birth to Uzi, or well, when she had her as a baby. But even after all that, it took time for Khan to get along with Nori. It was a type of relationship where Khan loved Nori too late, which made him regret not loving her sooner. And Nori dies early after they fall in love. As you can tell, it was a 50-50 at the beginning, but as time went on, they slowly grew a very close relationship, to the point they even had a family. 89% of the time, I hear this question roaming around the Murder Drones fandom. The question being, how did Nori fall in love with Khan out of all people? Khan only cares about the doors, and he's a coward. Meanwhile, Nori has a full-on rebellious personality. Now, what if I told you that it was the complete opposite of what we all thought? I mean, everyone always assumes that Khan was always a person who's in love with doors. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, it was actually Nori who told him to build the doors. She was always all, build doors against the coming sky demons. The singularity awakens. Look at this cool ass I can draw. <sighs> Turns out, I'm not who either of you needed. 
Just be safe. So, okay? if Nori told Pong to build the doors against the upcoming disassembly drones, and as he says that he's not the person that Nori needed, this makes me realize he didn't listen to Nori, and back then, he didn't build the doors of when she asked of him. At first, I used to question why, but as I kept researching and re-watching the murder drones on and on, more answers just get coming to me. I know this sounds crazy, but Khan used to be a rebel. But ever since Nori stepped into his life, he grew a soft spot and began to change into a better and more joyful person. And one who wasn't so serious all the time. This scene proves that Khan used to be one hell of a rebellious person. One that used to be an exact version of Uzi. He was basically a copy of Uzi. Like, sometimes I'm like, what the hell? So, Uzi got his personality from Khan. Okay. Mr. Doorman, your daughter has been uh, absent. Yes. On that kill all humans kick, like when I was younger. Grounded herself and all that. So, Khan used to not be a coward and actually have this serious type of a personality. And, sir, there's been an. Parenting, do you? I left her for dead once. It sounds like she's bored in your class, and the other kids suck. Call her damaged again, and I will install a door on your face! Where are your folks? Khan is honestly a character who's way more than what meets the eye. Throughout the Murder Drone Season 1 teaser posted by Glitch Productions, we see Khan's very own concept art. Not only is he holding a literal gun, he seems to also have a scar. The only time we saw a scar like that was in Episode 4 when V was scratching Uzi's screen with her claw. This means that Khan had been in contact with other Murder Drones before, and you know from what it seems like, he used to be a professional with these types of weapons. So I'm honestly gonna assume that he was a hunter back then, but he didn't build the doors because he thought he could take on the disassembly drones by himself and promise Nori that he would take whatever it is to fight for her. Nori was the type of person who wanted to protect her family and her people. She cares very deeply about Khan, and when she had Uzi as a baby, all she wanted was the best for her daughter. However, when the solver entered Nori and Khan's life, everything seemed to fall apart. There was this one scene which really caught my attention, and it was in Murder Drones Episode 3. It's the scene where Khan is just laying against Nori's door and is just in the zone, thinking about all the memories they had together, and he just has that I miss you so much and I wish you were here expression on his face. There was also another scene that honestly broke my heart into a million pieces, and it was in Episode 4, Cabin Fever, where Khan is just talking a bit about Nori to Uzi. And if you pause this exact scene and zoom in onto one of the boxes in the corner, it says a happy family before Nori went kooky and insane. When Nori started to attain her absolute solver powers, she began to take her powers for granted and started becoming smug and a bit egoistic. In this clip we see in episode 6 is a picture of Nori using her solver powers confidently like she has no problem and Yeva in the corner has her eyes closed and all badly hurt. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's Alice in the corner before she had her antlers and I'm guessing Nori killed her. Above Nori, we see some codes written on the top, and as decoded, it says no. From what I'm guessing, Yeva tried to warn Nori about the solver being a dangerous threat, but Nori didn't listen to her. At first, what seemed like a miracle of having the power that can break the laws of physics slowly unraveled itself to be a curse that you can't escape out of. There were times Nori couldn't control herself. When Nori would go home, Khan would just be heavily concerned about her. He saw all the drawings of what Nori made and also saw what used to be a happy, energetic, and fun woman is now turning into someone he never thought about before. When the disassembly drones came, it was too late. The person Khan loved and wanted to spend the rest of his life with was just gone, and there was sadly nothing he could do about it. Ever since that incident, Khan started building the doors that Nori asked of before. He continued her legacy of what she wanted. However, there's one minor problem. Khan can't get over the past. He's stuck in it. 
He's so focused on the concept of building doors and continuing Nori's legacy that he completely forgot what he's truly supposed to do. And that is being a good father towards Uzi. He is so lost in fame and being in the newspapers all the time, it's like he forgot his own personality completely. And the worst part is he's trying to change but can't see this as a new beginning. I really hope if Nori still is alive, she would somehow reunite with her family to something it was before. A happy family. An emotionally stable family. Even if it means that it might have a harsh start once they all meet up. However, it may have a chance to turn out well at the end. I really hope that Liam would put Khan in episode 7 and 8, growing a strong bond with Uzi. I feel like that's what we actually need throughout the Murder Drone series. It's for Khan to get some character development and Uzi to realize that Khan isn't truly a bad person. Additionally, I also hope that in episode 7, Uzi would somehow find revelations or receive them from someone or something on how Khan was before he turned into a coward and before how everything fell apart between Khan and Nori. Not gonna lie, I feel like in a way, Khan won't stay as a static character. Static character being a character who doesn't change or evolve throughout the series because if he was a serious character and is now soft, I think in a way his rebellious and disciplined personality can return. If this happens, he would become the type of father who would care about Uzi and help her out like an actual parental figure. I don't know about you, but in a small way, I see the relationship of Moana and her father very similar to Khan and Uzi. Moana's father was a conflict throughout Moana's journey. His fear of the ocean was going against Moana's will to go past the reef to restore the heart of Tefiti. However, Moana's father isn't a bad person, but the fear he had about how his friend died because of the ocean, he laid all these shit and problems towards Moana and doesn't let her go past the reef, even though he himself was just like Moana in the past, ready to explore the ocean and sail beyond the sea. This is basically Uzi's situation. Although Khan himself was just as rebellious and as brave as Uzi before, he just didn't want Uzi to end up like him. He didn't want Uzi to let her ego get in the way of her, for her wanting to fight for her to end up thinking she will always win superior to others. He doesn't want Uzi to lose someone she loves by her thinking she can handle every situation alone. The fear Khan held after Nori's death because of the three disassembly drones, one of them being N, needs to perish because this is a part of the main conflict. Yes, I know what you're about to say, but hear me out. This one is real. The Absolute Solver is the main antagonist, not the main conflict, but can cause something to be a part of the main conflict. Also, one last thing before I leave. Episode 7 is going to be the climax of the Murder Drone series. Climax is the main point of the story where the main conflict should be resolved, but is also the point with the highest tension throughout the story. Which, as Glitch Productions has admitted, that Episode 7 is going to be huge. Hope you guys enjoyed my character analysis. Sorry if it was short. Uzi, guess what? What is it, Anne? This conversation we're having is gonna be on the Ultimate Murder Drones collab! Huh? Yes, that is right, and this clip is by none other than me, Cosmo X Clouds. I'm basically gonna be doing some improv with a selective few of Murder Drones characters. <laughs> Did you just break the fourth wall? Crikey, we gotta stop breaking the fourth wall, everyone. Not my problem. Tessa, what's going on? Oh, nothing, Sin. We were just going to talk about the weather today. Ew, that sounds boring. It's improv, Lizzie. Who here keeps damaging my parts? Huh? <laughs> my eardrums are bleeding. I can't confirm. Um, the weather seems pretty snowy today. Like always, but, um... I'm con. I love doors! Dad, 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 you're being so cringe. What does that mean? Uh, Never mind. Wait, aren't I supposed to be dead right now? <laughs> well, I can change that. V! That's my best you're talking about right now.
Lizzie is such a traitor. Oh, this is on the Murder Drums collab. Hello, everyone. I hate humans. Except Tessa. You guys watching aren't humans, right? Oh, yeah, they're humans. I can confirm that they have a unique mind. Yeah, but the, the fan art is pretty cool. Oh, no. And don't look at the fan art. Huh? And whatever you do, don't look at the fan art. Indeed, some of them are masterpieces, but some... Oh, and you don't want to see it. Curiosity. What fan art? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing okay after witnessing the fan art. Y'all are lucky that you even get a lot of fan art. Yeah, for real. Like, you guys are so lucky. And, you know, just to change the subject, uh, you guys are invited to my shindig next weekend. <gasps> huh? <gasps> Gasp. Yes! I mean, yeah. Cool. Yeah. See you then. Okay, Thad. Anyways, back to the topic at hand. Those comic dubs are the worst thing I have ever laid my eyes on. Curiosity risen. What comic dubs? No, 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 no. Ugh, this is why effective drones were cloned more. What did you say? Uh, okay, uh, let's just roll to the next YouTuber's clip. Uh, downloading data on Murder Drones comic dubs. No! Oh no, they are so dead. Well, goodbye humans, I guess. Yeah, I guess this is it. Goodbye, internet. Goodbye, guys. I love you all so much. And I love doors. Goodbye. Farewell. Heh, <laughs> as they say in Russian. Oops, I should have predicted that Sin would find out what Murder Drones comics are. And now it is the end of the universe. Whoa, I guess we're not having that shindig, I guess. Ugh, seems so. Download complete. What in the silver of the absolute fabric? I am going to end all of you humans' lives. Well, just as Miyamoto always says, how was that? I hope you enjoyed and got to every decibel of your body to feel that Murderdron's feeling while you watch Murderdron's videos. And I will say, we do have a little bit of an announcement to make. Many people already know about this, but we are going to announce this today. So, take a look. Ah, hello. I am Sergeant Sean Johnson of the Worker Defense Force on Outpost 3, and my goodness are we excited to introduce the Worker Defense Force Night Watchman Program. All of us here at the WDF are so incredibly excited to launch Khan's latest security endeavor. Isn't that right, Mr. Norman? That's right, Sean. The Night Watchman program is truly a step up in modern day technology. Definitely. Now how can we expect the job to go? It's quite simple, actually. All you need to do is check the cameras. If you feel threatened, feel free to check the lights of the halls beside you. Or shut the doors. That sure sounds boring, but I'm sure that'll be what you want. You don't want an eventful evening getting attacked. Isn't that right? Yep, that is indeed the worst scenario, but I can assure you there's a low chance of that ever happening. Great! Next up we- What? Here we have, uh, WDF Broadcasting Technician Jeremy Richardson in the office right now to give us his impression on the program. I mean, I guess it's fine. We don't really need it, but Khan wanted it, so whatever. If it fails, it fails. Oh, for fuck! Thanks, Jerry. I mean, Jeremy. Was that the office man? And there you have it. If you'd like to join the Watchman program, please contact Gondorman within two days of this advert.
For those of you who don't have calendars, that's March 2nd. If you have been accepted, please be in the entrance storage room on March 3rd at 12 a.m. for in-person instruction. If Mr. Dorman is unavailable, the instructions will be provided via phone call, and hourly updates will be given until 6 a.m. Thank you, and we hope you join. Wow, wow. Thank you for the opportunity. Yup, that's right. Five Hours on Copper 9 is releasing today. We can play it now. Right now. Now. I've been your local YouTuber. And always will be an incredibly local YouTuber. Thank you to every single creator who collaborated with me to create this. Unhelpful commentary, Pyromaniac, Vanity Morph, Cosmo. Yaxter, just to name a few. So, my name has been your local YouTuber, and I will see you all down the streets.